This is a video in Clinical Medicine from the New England Journal of Medicine. Traditionally, when internal jugular vein cannulation has been performed, external anatomical landmarks and palpation have been used to guide insertion of the needle into the vessel. However, depending on the operator's experience and the patient's anatomy, this procedure may be difficult or unsuccessful. Over the past decade, the increased use of ultrasound to guide internal jugular vein cannulation has improved success rates, reduced the time required to perform the procedure, and resulted in fewer complications. This technique requires an understanding of the neck anatomy as well as skill in performing and interpreting the results of the ultrasound examination. This video demonstrates the equipment and techniques used to carry out real-time ultrasound-guided internal jugular vein cannulation. Ultrasound-guided internal jugular vein cannulation is performed to establish central venous access for a variety of purposes, such as monitoring of central venous pressure, insertion of pulmonary artery catheters, administration of intravenous therapeutic agents and nutrition, performance of hemodialysis, and placement of cardiac pacemakers. This procedure is also used in other situations in which direct access to the central circulation is needed. General contraindications for internal jugular vein cannulation include infection of the placement site and suspected pathologic conditions affecting the internal jugular vein or superior vena cava, such as occlusion due to coagulopathy. Caution should be used when landmarks are distorted by trauma or other anatomic anomalies, such as a goiter. Be careful when using this site in patients who have had prior injury to the internal jugular vein, have very small internal jugular veins, or are morbidly obese. Under these circumstances, you should consider alternative sites, such as the contralateral internal jugular vein or subclavian vein. The femoral vein should be avoided because of a higher incidence of infection. Ultrasound is a non-ionizing form of imaging that is safe for use in patients of all ages as well as in women who are pregnant. There are no contraindications specific to the use of ultrasound guidance when performing internal jugular vein cannulation. Central venous catheters vary in size, length, and number of infusion ports. The choice of catheter depends on the clinical circumstances. Commercially packaged catheterization kits are available. Kits may include drapes, disinfectant sponges, gauze pads, sutures with needles, a guide wire, a scalpel, a vein dilator, a penetration syringe, a guide syringe, an anesthetic syringe, and 1% or 2% lidocaine anesthetic solution. Ultrasound machines with linear array High-resolution vascular transducers are preferred for this procedure. You will also need sterile transduction gel, an acoustically transparent sterile transducer sheath, and sterile rubber bands or clips to secure the sheath around the transducer. When possible, explain the procedure to the patient and obtain written informed consent. Complications such as infection and bleeding should be discussed. A procedural timeout and checklist must be reviewed before you start the procedure. Continuous electrocardiography and pulse oximetry monitoring should be maintained throughout the procedure. Place the patient in the supine position. If the central venous pressure is not elevated, place the patient in the Trendelenburg position with the head down 10 to 15 degrees to increase jugular filling and reduce the possibility of air embolism. Alternatively, venous pressure can be elevated by placing a wedge beneath the patient's legs. Caution is advised when situating patients with high intracranial pressure or congestive heart failure in these positions, as they may exacerbate these conditions. Rotate the patient's head slightly to the contralateral side of the chosen site. 
Minimizing head rotation lessens the chance of causing the common carotid artery to lie posterior to the internal jugular vein. When the vein overlaps the artery, a through and through puncture of the jugular vein may inadvertently lead to carotid artery puncture. You can minimize this possibility by making sure that the needle is not perpendicular to the vein as you advance it. Cannulation of the right internal jugular vein is generally preferred to cannulation of the left because it provides more direct access to the right atrium, avoids the thoracic duct, reduces procedure time, and is associated with fewer complications. The two heads of the sternocleidomastoid and the clavicle form a triangle at the anterior neck. The internal jugular vein may be accessed within this triangle, approximately 2 to 3 centimeters above the clavicle. Performing venous puncture higher in the triangle reduces the risk of pneumothorax and allows for better compression of the carotid artery in the case of inadvertent carotid puncture. Before starting the procedure, perform an ultrasound survey to assess the location and patency of the internal jugular vein and to evaluate the neck anatomy. Place the transducer so that the resulting image on the screen correlates with the orientation of the anatomy. Place the probe parallel and cephalad to the clavicle and along the sternocleidomastoid muscle. The common carotid artery and internal jugular vein should be easily identifiable. You will see the common carotid artery as a pulsating image, and it will be difficult to compress. The internal jugular vein is larger, easily compressible, and non-pulsating. Make sure that the internal jugular vein is patent by gently compressing the vein with the transducer. Slight pressure is sufficient to collapse the lumen of the internal jugular vein. Use Doppler color flow imaging to assist in identifying the vessels and determining flow. Doppler flow can be used to further identify the carotid artery and the internal jugular vein. You may place the transducer in either the cross-sectional or the longitudinal view. Placing the transducer in a standardized position during the ultrasound examination facilitates interpretation of the resulting images. Many probes have a marker on one side that corresponds to the same side of the image on the screen. This helps the operator to identify the correct orientation of the image. The longitudinal view aligns the large vessels and needle parallel to the ultrasound beam. In this view, the entire shaft and tip of the needle, as well as the course of a single vessel, can be visualized. The transverse approach aligns the anatomy and needle perpendicular to the ultrasound beam. Structures are visualized in cross-section, allowing you to identify both the internal jugular vein and the common carotid artery. If there is no contraindication, have the patient perform the Valsalva maneuver which facilitates identification of the vein by increasing intrathoracic pressure and decreasing venous return. The maneuver will further dilate the internal jugular vein, helping to confirm its location. Whether you use longitudinal or transverse alignment of the transducer, you should try to locate the tip of the needle in relation to the ultrasound beam and the internal jugular vein. This is especially important when viewing the structures in cross-section, since the needle will appear as only a dot on the screen, and determining the exact location of the tip may be difficult. Evaluate the potential placement site with the use of ultrasound before establishing a sterile field. Confirm that the proposed vein is patent by ensuring that it is compressible. After you have identified an acceptable site for cannulation, you will need an assistant. Since performing central venous access carries the risk of infection, follow universal precautions when placing a central line. This includes hand washing, wearing a sterile gown, surgical cap, mask, eye protection and gloves, and using a full-size sterile drape. Once the patient is positioned, prepare the skin using a chlorhexidine-based antiseptic and cover the area with a sterile, fenestrated drape. 
If the patient is not receiving general anesthesia, anesthetize the insertion site with 1% or 2% lidocaine. Take great care to avoid the intra-arterial injection of lidocaine, as even a small amount of the local anesthetic may precipitate central nervous system toxicity. Lidocaine should also be used for sedated patients in the intensive care unit. To prepare the ultrasound probe, have the assistant, who need not be dressed in sterile garb, dispense enough acoustic gel into a sterile transducer sheath to cover the transducer surface inside the sheath. Have the assistant carefully feed the probe into the sheath and through the gel, while extending the sterile sheath away from you over the length of the probe wire. Eliminate any wrinkles in the sheath and any air bubbles between the transducer and the sheath. Secure the sheath around the transducer using sterile rubber bands or plastic clips. To complete acoustic coupling, apply a small amount of sterile ultrasound gel to the covered ultrasound probe or to the patient's skin. Because the sterile ultrasound probe is used intermittently throughout the procedure, it is necessary to identify a convenient sterile area on which the probe can be placed when it is not in use. This demonstration will illustrate the use of ultrasound guidance in a central approach in which the needle is inserted between the two heads of the sternocleidomastoid muscle for internal jugular cannulation. Position the transducer so that the internal jugular vein is centered in the resulting ultrasound image and between the two heads of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Gently palpate the skin to confirm that the puncture will be between the muscle heads and not through one of the heads. Using an 18-gauge needle, puncture the skin at the center of the transducer, being careful not to damage the sterile sheath. Advance the needle at a 45-degree angle. As you advance the needle, maintain negative pressure in the syringe until the vein is punctured. When the needle passes caudally underneath the transducer, the needle, as well as soft tissue tenting, can be viewed on the ultrasound screen. While it may not be possible to see the needle clearly as it advances toward the vein, soft tissue tenting is almost always observed. After the needle has penetrated the tissues, the use of short in and out or tapping movements may help you to visualize the trajectory of the needle. In addition, the location of the needle tip may be visualized by tilting the transducer back and forth or by withdrawing the needle and realigning it. However, since ultrasonography does not necessarily confirm the location of the tip, look for aspiration of blood in the syringe. If you do not aspirate blood as the needle is advanced, slowly withdraw the needle while maintaining negative pressure. Venous puncture may become evident as you withdraw the needle. Occasionally, pressure from the ultrasound probe may compress the vein, making it difficult to enter the vessel. The tip of the needle may only compress the wall of the internal jugular vein rather than puncture it. This is more likely to occur when larger gauge needles are used. In this situation, a short, quick thrust may be sufficient for the needle to penetrate the lumen of the vein. As soon as blood is freely aspirated, place the probe in the predetermined sterile location, stabilize the needle, and disconnect the syringe. Confirm that the blood flow is non-pulsatile. Bright red pulsatile blood is suggestive of arterial puncture. However, dark, non-pulsatile blood does not exclude the possibility of arterial puncture. Using the Seldinger technique, introduce a flexible guide wire through the needle and into the vein. While holding the guide wire in place, remove the needle. At this point, the guide wire within the lumen of the vein can be visualized on the screen in both cross-sectional and longitudinal views. If you have any doubt about the location of the wire, the blood pressure can be measured by advancing a small catheter over the wire and then removing the wire and connecting the catheter to a transducer. Once the possibility of arterial cannulation is excluded, reinsert the guide wire through the catheter and then remove the catheter while leaving the guide wire in place. Use a scalpel to make a small incision in the skin to widen the opening. Thread the guide wire through the distal opening of a dilator 
until it exits through the proximal end of the dilator. Confirm that it has reached the proximal end of the dilator, hold the wire in place, and advance the dilator through the skin and into the vessel. While holding the guide wire in place, remove the dilator. Bleeding frequently occurs after the dilator is withdrawn. Minimize it by applying pressure until the bleeding subsides. Insert the guide wire through the distal opening of the central venous catheter until it exits through the proximal end of the catheter. Secure the proximal end of the wire to prevent inadvertent advancement into the vessel and then advance the catheter into the vein. Hold the proximal end of the guide wire at all times when advancing the dilator or catheter. This avoids complications from unintended advancement of the guide wire. Using ultrasound, verify that the catheter is properly placed within the lumen of the vessel. Once proper placement is achieved, remove the guide wire and anchor the catheter to the skin with sutures. Each port should be flushed with saline solution and fluid should be administered as needed. Obtain a chest radiograph to confirm proper placement of the catheter. Cannulation of the internal jugular vein is an invasive procedure that can result in infection, air embolism, or death. Complications from mechanical injury include carotid artery puncture, skin hematoma, pneumothorax, hemothorax, and catheter misplacement. Mechanical irritation of the heart by the guide wire is also possible, and it may cause atrial or ventricular arrhythmias. If this occurs, withdraw the wire into the superior vena cava. Arrhythmias are usually transient, but if persistent, immediate attention is required. The unintended placement of a large bore catheter into the carotid artery, for example, a 9 French introducer, will be evident when bright red pulsatile blood appears. Such an event is an emergency and requires immediate consultation with a surgeon. Although ultrasound guidance is the recommended technique for internal jugular vein cannulation, complications may occur. Ultrasound-guided internal jugular vein cannulation should be considered complementary to the landmark technique, and its success depends on the provider's skill and understanding of ultrasound technique and function, as well as on his or her knowledge of neck anatomy. Proper use of ultrasound guidance can substantially minimize potential complications while reducing procedure time and facilitating proper catheter placement.